so that's what we're going to be talking about together with you this morning and over the next several weeks. If you happen to bring a Bible with you, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to the book of Psalm. Psalms 139 is where we'll be spending our time together this morning. If you didn't happen to bring a copy of the scripture with you, most of the references that I'll be uh, picking out for you will be on the screen and you can follow along that way. If you are here for the first time, I know several of you were invited by friends and have never been to High Point Church before or haven't been in quite some time. Um, then I hope that you grabbed one of these connection cards when you came in and you'll fill this out. Uh, if you've been looking for a home, I think you found it. And I'd like to get to know you better. Our staff would like to get to know you better. And by the way, if you don't want to mess around with a card, I, at, at my age, I still think it's cool to be able to say that we have a QR code on our card. And you can take a picture of that and you can fill it out on our app or on our website. Give us your information. We'd love to get to know you better. And if you've got a few minutes after service, we do something called Starting Point. It's in a ministry room right over here to my left, your right. And uh, you can meet some of the staff, spend a few minutes, have a cup of coffee with us, uh, ask some questions you may have about what you experienced when you came in today. If you have some time this coming Wednesday, every month, we do something called Connection Class, and that happens this Wednesday at 6. All of our midweek activities kick off. Connection is especially for you if you're new to High Point. We spend some time with you telling you things we believe and all the ministries we offer and how you can get engaged and you get to meet all of the ministry leaders. And since we're new to the building, we give you a tour of the building. We're learning it just like you are now, so uh, we'll give you a tour of the building. We'd love to spend that hour with you this coming Wednesday at 6 p.m. Next Sunday, when you make your way in here, you'll see a table, at two tables actually out in the foyer. One is a voter registration table. You know that this is an election year, and so we want you to get registered to vote this year. And so you'll have an opportunity, supervisor of election will have a table you can sign up. And we also have a group called Salt and Light that is just beginning here at High Point. And if you're interested in learning about the Christian background of the United States, about what it means for us as believers to be involved in the political process, especially locally, if you would like to learn more about that and, and be a part of a group that will make you aware of things that you need to be aware of, Salt and Light is a group for you. We'd love for you to be a part of that. And then you heard Jordan talk about Super Sunday that's coming up on February the 13th. We love this. Every Super Bowl Sunday we do this. We tell you to wear the jersey of your favorite team, and it's the one Sunday of the year that you're allowed to talk trash. So you can just come in here and talk trash, find somebody that's from Alabama, somebody that's an Alabama fan and make fun of them that this year they didn't win the Alabama Invitational. Find somebody and just have a blast. We're going to have a lot of fun. We'll have other activities on that day together. And that's always, every Sunday is a good Sunday for you to bring a friend. But uh, Super Bowl Sunday, Super Sunday here at High Point would be a great day for you uh, to invite them. Psalms 139. I want to read just one verse, but we are going to go all the way through this psalm together. So I would encourage you, if you do have your Bible, to keep them open. The scripture says, your eyes saw my unformed body and all the days you ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I was having breakfast with a friend and somebody that I hoped would become a new friend not too long ago. And uh, we had just ordered and my new friend put his elbows on the table and leaned towards me and he said, so Jack, what's your story? What's your story? And for some reason, I was speechless. Now, those of you who know me understand how stunning that development is, and some of you are filing that away for future conversations with me when you want me to shut up, but I really seriously had to give that some thought because that's a big question, and when somebody asks you what's your story, you're not exactly sure what story they're looking for or what story you can trust them with, and some, some, some of us are not even very familiar with what our story is or whether we even have one. It's not, I didn't, have, I didn't have a struggle with it because it was a bad question. I mean, what is he supposed to ask? So Jack, what's your blood type? Or so Jack, what's your social security number? Those would be off-putting and awkward, wouldn't they? You don't ask those questions over breakfast. You probably should never ask those questions. When we want to get to know someone, that's the question. What's your story? Tell me your story. We, we all do this because as human beings, we view life in story form. We all see our life as a plot. We see a beginning, a middle and an end. It's normal for us. Psychologists say this is instinctual for human beings. They call it, they say that we have a narrative bias. And they say that human beings do this because it's a coping me mechanism we've developed through evolution. It helps us and it helps our brains process and organize overwhelming information. But I, I believe it's not just a coping mechanism. 
I think we do it because we understand that it's real, that life is a story, and that it does have meaning and purpose. It, it, and it reveals a great truth. One of my favorite authors has said, I always believed that life was a story. And if, if life is a story, then it has to have a storyteller. And the, the author of the Psalms agrees with that statement. He says it right here. All the days that were ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I think that's why Jesus taught the way that he did. The scripture says that when Jesus spoke, he spoke all things to the crowds in parables, and he didn't say anything to them without using a parable. You know that a story can get past defenses that an argument can't get past. And so Jesus taught in story form. We call them parables. The word para means beside something, and the word bowl means literally to throw it down. And so when Jesus told a parable, he was doing a truth bomb. He was a truth mic drop on the crowd. Argue with that, if you will. It took quite a while for him to even figure out what he meant, and by the time they figured him out, he had moved on to the next story most of the time. Jesus used stories to help us comprehend our story. And more importantly, he used stories to help us get to know our storyteller. So today we're beginning here at High Point a new series that we'll be in for the next several weeks and it's called What's Your Story? And every week we're going to take you to one of the parables of Jesus. We're going to see what he had to say and then we're going to try and learn from that what it says about our story and where we fit in God's story. But I thought we would set the table this morning in this psalm, particularly with this line, all the days that you had ordained for me were written in your book before I'd ever lived the first one. Elie Wiesel said this, God created human beings because he loves stories. I think it's a great line. God created human beings because he loves stories. And when he penned this line, the psalmist had finally grasped that truth and he was celebrating that he had met his storyteller. But it didn't, he didn't get there easily. He didn't start off happy about what he was discovering. And he had to fight to remember it every day. So this psalm is a description of the process that he went through to get to where he was happy to have met the storyteller. So I want to walk you through it because we all fight the same battle, every one of us. And that's why my friend's question at breakfast stumped me. Sometimes I have trouble figuring out what my story is or believing that there is any meaning or purpose to these events that seem so random in my life. We all fight daily to comprehend the great story, to understand our story, and to connect with our storyteller. Without the help of God's word and the spirit, we will at least for a time find ourselves, all of us, living stories we simply don't understand. And, and more importantly, stories that you were not designed to live. So many people in this world are living stories that other people wrote for them. God didn't write it for you. And you're living a story you were not designed to live. And I think this, the process this writer went through captures the stages in broad strokes that everybody goes through. Now, you're going to be different. Your story will be different from mine in the details. But in the broad strokes, we almost all go through these stages together. For instance, I would, I would title chapter one of this man's story, Man on the Run. Okay, so I'm going to start at verse one uh, of Psalms 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, you know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If if I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn or if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand guides me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. So I was at Pioneer Days a few day, uh, months ago uh, down by Lake Wales and I was standing between the booths and I was looking at something on my cell phone, just kind of distracted. And I noticed a guy l- looking at me. And then after he had looked at me, you know how you try and ignore someone, you know, and you're on your cell phone, you act like you're on your cell phone, you go, what's this guy's problem, you know? And then he walks up to me and he goes, hey, you're Jack Hillegoss, aren't you? Well, I couldn't deny it, but I wasn't happy that he knew me. I I mean, my first reaction wasn't, hey, you know me, that's awesome, let's sit down and talk. 
Let's be friends. Have y'all ever had somebody come up on you like they knew you and you're wondering, where did you come from? That was my reaction to this guy. My first, re- it was suspicion and concern. Who are you? And what do you want to know about me? Having someone know you when you don't know them can be awkward and even intimidating. I was not happy that this man knew me. By the way, if you know me and want to introduce yourself, don't, this is a story for a sermon. I'll like you, I promise. But, uh, but you, you guys understand what I'm talking about, Right? And so it was, I just didn't, I wasn't celebrating, especially because he seemed to know a lot about me. And there are some things I would rather people not know. You begin to wonder how much they know and how they know it and who told them. I tell you that because this guy is not happy that God knows him so well. I have read this Psalms dozens of times in my life, and whenever we read it, we always make it sound like he's so happy about this situation, and you guys know what I'm talking about. You've been to church, and uh, when church folks read this Psalm, they get into this sing-songy voice. They take on that prayer whisper, you know, you, oh Lord, have searched me, and you know me. Thank you, Jesus. Do you all know what I'm talking about? You get that church voice when you read this? This guy was not happy about what he was writing. He uses several words in these opening verses to describe God's knowledge. And he is not praising, he's complaining. For instance, when he speaks of God searching him, that word in the original almost means he's calling God a nitpicker. In other words, do you know what I mean? You've ever had someone who in your life, it felt like they were trying to find your fault and the better they know you, the quicker they can get to it. That's what this guy is calling God. You have searched me and you know me. You're a nitpicker. You're always going after the bad things. And that's how he felt about God. You sift my thoughts. You follow me around. Even in my own head, I can't get away from you. God, you're always up in my business. And it wasn't pleasant. Felt like God was looking for his faults and his failures. And he gets even more intense when he says, before a word is on my tongue, You understand it all together. Have you ever tried to debate or argue with someone who finishes your sentences? Come on, guys, you're married. I'm putting you in dangerous territory here, but you have ever had an argument with someone who finishes your sentences and it makes you mad because they get it right. They know know what you're going to say before you say it. And so he says, you hem me in. In other words, I can't win an argument with you. I try and fight with you, and you corner me. And you lay your hand on me, and you hem me in. I can't win when I fight with you. This is what happens when you try to argue with God. God knows your thoughts. He knows what you've done. He deserves your, he discerns your thoughts. And so he will hem you in. You can't win. Your arms are too short to box with the Lord. So if you can't argue with God, you run from him. Verse 7 of this passage, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? That's not a rhetorical question. He really wants to know, how can I get away from you? Where can I go that you're not there? Anyone here ever tried to run away from God? Sure. People try to run away from God all the time. Some of you are thinking, yeah, that's why I came to church. I thought I was safe here. (laughs) A lot of you who grew up in church are running away from God. Because you got a picture of God in church that made you angry and hurt you. And so you've spent your life running away from God. And, and, and you showed up today because your mom made you come or something. But some of you, you, your parents are making you come. But as soon as you turn 18, I'm getting away from this God thing. I'm going to run as far as I can, as fast as I can. You see God as intrusive and oppressive. You just want to get away. Well, this man gave it his best shot. He had climbed high. He had walked far. He had sunk low. He had run fast. One of the most powerful lines, this is where it leads to in verse 8, he says, if I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. Now, I think the King James Version gets this right when it says, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. He had run so far and so fast trying to get away from God that he had ended up in a situation that felt like hell. And even in hell, God was still there. I think we need to stop and let that take root because some of you, some of you have done the same thing. You're running away from God and you wound up in hell. I'm I'm just going to let, I'm going to throw this out here because I'm a preacher and you can do with it what you want to, but when you start running away from heaven, you're going to wind up in hell. 
And so he's running away from God into some deep and dark and desperate and lonely place. This is where we wind up. Some of you are here. You've sold all that you have to feed an addiction you can't get control of. Your heat's been turned off. Your water's been turned off. Your family won't have anything to do with you. You only get to see your kids once a month, and that's if they even want to see you anymore. Some of you sit alone in a dark bedroom day after day and pull the covers up over your head because you can't even muster your way out of depression long enough to go out and face the world. And if your wife finds out what you've done, what's she going to do? You can't take back the mistakes you've made, the stupid decisions you've made, the way that you've wrecked everything. You've earned a lot and you've built a lot, but your family can't stand you. Folks, running from God always will have you making your bed in hell. This is where the man found himself. And when you've made your bed in hell, and when you've done so much wrong, and when you've wrecked your life so badly, the next move is, I just want to hide from God and everybody. Verse 11 of the passage, he says, If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, the light will become night around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. He's trying to hide from God. I'll just ignore it. I just won't pay attention. I I, I will never bring it up. I I will keep this part of my life in the dark forever. I will keep it a secret. I'll stuff the pain and the shame deep down. I'll go someplace where they don't know me. I will move to a new city and start all over. I'll move to Lake Wales. Even God can't find Lake Wales. Not even God knows that, and nobody will ever know me, and I'll I'll just take on a new identity. I'll start a new story, and you just keep starting stories over and over and over again because you weren't meant to write your own story. I'll hide in the dark from God. Now, in all of these angry and desperate words, I see the two main reasons that we struggle with God. We struggle with our storyteller. And the first one is pride. Now, again, we're going to talk about a lot of things over the next several weeks, but these are the two big headers. And, we, and all, of our, all of our rebellion against the storyteller goes down under these two headings. The first one is pride. I, I, want, I want to write my own story. There's a nonprofit group. Uh, it's called StoryCorps. And all they do is invite people to tell their story. They travel around uh, to cities all over the United States, the carnivals and fairs, and they set up a booth, and um, they, they, let, they invite people to come and tell their story, and they record it. And when they are done, when you're done telling your story, they'll give you a CD copy of the recording, and then they send another one to the Library of Congress. So be careful. Okay? But uh, so far, over 40,000 people have taken advantage of this opportunity to tell their story. And so I, I, I read that and I think we don't have a problem with our story, but we want to tell it. We want to tell our story. Suppose StoryCorps pulled up into the parking lot of High Point Church today and on your way out of the service, you could walk into their booth and tell your story. How would you tell your story? What would your story be? What dreams are you chasing? Are you right now living the life that you imagine that you would live? What is your story? We run from God because we want to create our own stories. We were made to live in God's big drama, but but when we cut that out, all we're left with is little stories that we have to make up to try and infuse meaning into our days. Some of us live the victim story. Some of us, um, we just walk around all the time, everything goes wrong for me. The whole world is against me. The system is rigged against me. And sadly, we're living in a culture that encourages whole groups of people today to live the victim story. Some of us are trying to build our story on romance. Oh, did you see how he looked at me? He's the one. He's the one that God meant. There are seven billion people on the face of the earth. You're not that lucky. Am am I telling you the truth? Listen to your dad. He knows what he's talking about. No, he's not. No, he's not the one. Some of you, your story is you're the well-educated one. And some of you are the successful one. And I've got the house on the lake. And this is how you want people to perceive you. And you do everything you can to make sure the cover of your book keeps people from ever actually looking at the pages underneath big accomplishments, bold adventures, whatever it is, it's our story. And we get angry and we get bitter when God intrudes or things don't work out. It's our pride that makes us run away from the real storyteller. Or another one is shame. Shame keeps us away from the real story. 
Arthur Conan Doyle was the, the man who wrote almost all, I think, all of the Sherlock Holmes stories. In the 19th century, he was connected to many influential citizens in the city of London. And one time, as a practical joke, he wrote a letter, unsigned, and sent it to 12 of the leading citizens of, the, of London. And when they opened it, this is all they read. Flee! Flee the city immediately! All has been discovered. In 24 hours, all 12 of them had run out of the city. I, I tell you that we all have things in our story we hope nobody ever finds out about. Right? We all have parts of our story we hope nobody ever finds out about. Times we made our bed in hell, stuff that we try to hide in the darkness, running from God, hiding from God. It's a part of all of our stories. But then the song begins to turn. He says, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. And if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand guides me. Your right hand holds me fast. He starts thinking about it. He's looking back on all of the things that he's done and all the places that he's run to. And he begins to realize something that's amazing to him. God was always there. No matter where he went, no matter what he did, even when he made his bed in hell, God was there. God was there in the drug house, and God was there in the pimp's house, and God was there when he was laying in the gutter, and God was there when his marriage was falling apart, and God was there when he was doing the shady deal. You have never been any place in this world that God wasn't there. And it begins to dawn on him that his hand was guiding. Even when he was running away, God's hand was guiding him. This is a part of our story. The Lord is the author and the finisher of our faith, and he's always been pursuing us, and he's always been protecting us, and he's always been guiding us, even right up to this moment. Even even in you finding your way into this sanctuary this morning, the storyteller brought you here. He's writing your story. And if your story were up to you, if you had to find your truth, and if you had to make your own happiness and your own meeting, you're going to lose heart. But what if... In the real story, you don't have to find God. What if in the real story, God comes looking for you? What if in the true story, God has always been looking for you? Always been working in your life. What if, what if he followed you into the darkness of hell? And what if in those places where you finally thought you could escape him, you were surprised to find he was running right towards you? What if God has always been running after you? What if your real story begins when you realize how determined God is to save you? How he loves you more than you could possibly imagine. What if that were the beginning of your story? This man finally moves into that light and now the shift occurs. And I call this chapter two, discovering your true story. So he begins, he writes, for you created my inmost being, Lord. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in a secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me you are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. And when I awake, I'm still with you. Obviously, this, there's a change here, and now you begin to hear him say, I praise you, God. I, I, your works are wonderful. How precious are your thoughts towards me? It feels abrupt, and you wonder what happened to make him change his tone with this God that he was so angry with. Follow him now. <clears throat> he says, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me. Remember, that's how the first chapter ended. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me. And I've already dealt with that figuratively, but I think there's something being portrayed literally here. This man is tired. He's just wore out. And, and now he just wants to get some sleep and he's going to go to bed. And, and I say that because this section ends with this. When I wake up, I'm still with you. I'm going to go turn the lights out, and when I wake up, though, I'm still with you. So he's describing things he learned, things he discovered at night when he was trying to go to sleep. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I don't want to learn anything when I'm trying to go to sleep. When I turn the lights off, I have one goal, go to sleep as fast as possible. And that's what was on this man's mind. He started, but, but something happened, and he started praying what I call nighttime prayers. You guys know what nighttime prayers are. Anybody pray nighttime prayers? 
You see, there are church prayers, and church prayers are usually very respectful. And we, when we pray church prayers, we do all the talking, and we talk about stuff we think we know. And church prayers, Jesus said, we pray so that we can be seen and heard. And church prayers usually learn, end with us saying, I thank you, O oh God, that I'm not like all of these sinners that didn't come to church this Sunday morning. I showed up and did my duty. That's how church prayers go. But nighttime prayers, these are broken heart prayers. These are personal, passionate prayers. They're real and they're honest. Usually they're tear-stained. And they end with something like, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's a nighttime prayer. And here's another thing. God usually is the one that starts the nighttime prayers. God starts them. And, I'm, and in nighttime prayers, God tells us about things we need to learn. And if you know God, you know about nighttime prayers. You, you go to bed and all you want to do is go to sleep. And then God turns the lights on. And usually God shows up to do nighttime prayers somewhere between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. That's usually, come on now, I'm doing better than y'all are letting on. You guys have been through this. Nighttime prayers, when there's nothing to distract you and there's nowhere to go, and that's when we do our worst worrying and our most desperate praying, and finally, finally, when there's nothing to distract us, we begin to think. As he did that nighttime praying, he came to grips with two huge realities we all need to, uh, to survive. He understood how he was created, and he finally began to understand what he was created for. First of all, he says, he says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I was woven together. Marvelous are your works. How powerful and carefully chosen those words are. You, you wove me together. You knit me together. When I was a young man, my father pastored a church in north central Ohio in a little town called Loudonville. And Loudonville, was, it was the kind of town, it was the kind of church where they still had the women's quilting uh, circle. Did anybody ever go to a church that had a quilting circle or seen people do quilting? You, one thing I've learned about quilts is you don't mass produce quilts. These ladies would get together, they would plan them out. They would pick the strands and they laid the design out before they ever started and then they, they would weave them carefully together to make it happen. This is what this guy is saying. He's saying, this is the way God created you. You're not a mass production. You didn't come off this, the assembly line. God chose the strands and he, he carefully wove, uh, weaved you together. That's how you're made. You're not an accident. And there's nothing accidental about you. Do, guys, do you, un, do you know that in your body, you have about 10 trillion cells in your body? 10 trillion. And, and, and each one of your cells contains about six feet of DNA strands. That means if the DNA that's just in your body alone was, was uh, tied together and stretched out, they could go to the sun and back 61 times. That's the strand that God chose. These are the pieces that God chose to make you. That's the thread that he wove into you. Before you were a twinkle in your daddy's eye, the Lord was already deciding on your skin color and your eye color and the texture of your hair and that smile that would make your future husband fall in love with you. The father was already choosing all of these things about you. And, and that's the reason I think, now this is just me, I'm not quoting scripture, it's just Pastor Jack, I'm slightly below in authority. Okay, but here's the thing, that's why it takes nine months for a baby to be born. God could just pop those babies out like this. You could just say, I want a baby, God could deliver a baby tomorrow, right? But nine months he works on, weaving these children together in their mother's womb. I don't know, in the, in the 70s when I was there in Ohio, you guys may remember this, there was a pop song that came out by a guy named Randy Newman, and it was called Short People Got No Reason to Live. <laughs> and I knew every word of that song, and I was bebopping along one day, singing that, short people got no reason, short people, come on, you guys join me. Okay, and then all of a sudden it dawned on me, wait a minute, what about ugly people? And then I started thinking about myself and I got really self-aware because I've got a big nose and I wear thick glasses and my teeth are crooked and my ears look like car doors have been left standing open from behind. I'm just a train wreck. What, what was God thinking when he made this? I, I, and, and yet the psalmist says, when I really think about it, God doesn't make any mistakes. How wonderful are your works? How wonderful are your works? How bored God must be with us trying to look like models for Mademoiselle or Muscle and Fitness. 
But we struggle here. We're dominated by this because we haven't dealt with the deeper level. And that's why I was created. He starts it all off with this. For you created my inmost being. My inmost being. The God who created your body created your body to house your soul. To house your heart. The deepest part of you. In fact, he made that first. And it's the most important part of your life. It's that part of you that looks back at you when you're looking into the mirror and when you get past all of the superficial stuff and you start asking questions like, who am I really? And what am I here for? And what matters? Now, we may differ in the details, but the story is the same. Eventually, we all follow the clues to the door of our inmost being, the place that each of us has to go and ask questions that some of us are scared to death to ask. Questions like, does anything matter? Or am I just making it up as I go along? Is there any meaning? Or am I just an accident, just the result of mindless chemical or biological processes? Or did someone design me? And if he designed this outward me, then he's the only one that can help me understand my inmost being. So he arrives here at verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days that you ordained for me were written in your book before any one of them came to be. One of my favorite authors has said, our problem is that most of us live our lives like a movie that we showed up to 20 minutes late. And you're sitting there trying to figure out it. The action is happening, and you don't know who the star is, or what's going on, or why is he doing that, and you can't ask anyone because they get ticked at you. Every human stone or flower is a mystery to which we've lost the key. We're in the middle of some story here. And we're certain to misunderstand it. And so we all spend our lives trying to figure it out, looking for someone to help us. Someone, please tell me what this is all about. But every attempt of our own story through or finding our story through others fails because this story is too big. And we'll always miss the most important parts until we meet the storyteller. And we understand that he has written all of our days in his book. He ordained them for us. He had a plan and a design. And that's an amazing thing, because then it all starts to make sense. It doesn't make it easy, but it begins to make sense. Every part of it, the good and the bad, the deep yearnings that catch us by surprise, the days that we spend in hell. Have you ever caught a song on the radio? You're just going along having a great day, and a song on the radio makes you cry. Or you're driving down Highway 17 and hit the ridge when the orange blossoms are out and the sun is just starting to go down. And what that does to you, that's your inmost being. And only the storyteller can get you there to help you understand that. There's a deeper story about us and suddenly we begin to realize it has to be true. We always believed that life was a story. And so there has to be a storyteller. He met his creator and he finally begins to understand the story. Okay. So this is what we're going to talk about over the next several weeks here at High Point. We're going to look at Jesus, the great storyteller, and follow his stories and find our place in the story. And each week we're going to look at one of them. But let me finish this morning with this. You have to stay in the process. This is not going to be easy. And so I want to I'm pick up here at verse 19. If only God you would slay the wicked, away from me you were bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. I hate those who hate you, Lord. I abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. Count them my enemies. Search me, O God, (laughs) and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Again, you kind of get whiplash as you follow this guy. He, he's just finished this beautiful prayer. Dear Lord, you're such a great creator. Marvelous are your works. That my soul, my soul knows full well. You wove me together in my mother's womb. It is so beautiful. And then all of a sudden, now God, if you just kill all the wicked people, I hate, 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 hate them. Have you ever been listening to someone pray and you open your eyes like, did they just say that? Were they supposed to say that? Have you ever done that? That's what we're all doing. What is going on with this guy? Like, like you can hear better with your eyes open. And, um, but really, you're looking to see if anybody else heard it because we aren't supposed to pray like this. Okay, well, we could say a lot about this, and I want to, but we've got to wrap up for this morning. So just remember, he's done running and hiding. This guy is a brand new believer. <clears throat> he's finally met the storyteller. And, if we, and, and he's just being honest now. He doesn't like things that he sees in the world. And, and, and by the way, I know you all do your church talk, but every one of you have got things you see in the world that you wish God would explain to you because it doesn't make sense. 
And if we were honest, if God would come to us and say, I think we need to eliminate a few people, you could pull out a list for his consideration. Yeah, God, I've been marking them. Uh, Let me march you down to their house. I know who you need to take out right now. Job went to see if God would destroy Nineveh. You remember that? And I'm going to sit here and see if God will burn these people up. The disciples said, will you now call down fire from heaven? And every one of us, if we're trying to live this story, there are going to be days that we wish we could tell God who to knock off. (laughs) And by the way, we all, we all every once in a while think that we could tell God how to run the world better than he's running it. Amen? Amen. It's the height of arrogance for us to say, man, God, if you want to check in with me, I could tell you how to do this a little bit better. But his prayer doesn't end there, and that's good news. Search me, O God, and know my heart. I'll say this one more time. Don't start telling God how to run the world until you've listened to God about getting your own business straightened out. And here's the great news. God already knows everything there is to know about you. All of your frustrations, all of your failures. the things that make you angry, your anxious thoughts, your heartbreaks, the way you talk when you think you're by yourself, and he still loves you. He still leads us. He still walks with us. He still keeps helping us. He still keeps writing the next page in our story. And when this song began, the man was screaming at a God that he thought was intruding into his life and knew him too well. And now it ends with him praising a God who knows him completely and loves him so well. To be loved but not known is comforting, but it's superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But a God that fully knows us And truly loves us. That's the greatest story of all. Why don't you all pray with me? So there's a lot of people in this place this morning. And so there are a lot of stories. And uh, Father you know every one of them. There are folks in here who have been running from you. They showed up today because a friend invited them or the new building is a curiosity. Somebody bribed them with lunch. But the bottom line is their only plan is to spend as little time as possible here and then get as far away as they can. They're still running. There's someone here this morning that has made their bed in hell. Hell is the best description of the life they're living right now. Their marriage is falling apart. They're depressed Sometimes even thoughts of ending their own life have crossed through their mind. They're in the dark. And it's your spirit, Lord, that can penetrate, and really only your spirit, that can reach past all of our anger and all of our defenses, all of the way that we show ourselves to other people. They can't get past it, but you're the storyteller, and you can. So I'm praying, Spirit of the living God, that you will search our hearts today and that you would speak in a way that only you can, so that these people can hear you calling them. The one here today who needs to know your salvation, that needs to meet the Christ who died for them. The one today who needs to know that there's hope for tomorrow. I pray, God, that you'll help us to listen to you and begin to think anew about the fact that there is a storyteller and that we can be a part of it all. And don't let any of us leave here today, God, without doing business with you, As we sing, we pray that that you would just help us draw closer and in some way, great or small, draw us, change us. Make us look a little bit more like Christ, we pray. In his name we ask it, amen. Stand with me, folks. We're gonna sing one more song. If you need prayer, you come. You can come up.